What's up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and I'm extremely excited to introduce you to another special guest. This is Amir. What's up, Amir? What's going on, guys? This is Amir, R&B artist from Toronto. What's up, Brand Man? How's it going? Nothing much, man. I just want to say before I even get into the conversation, though, like Amir, there's a reason I, I have Amir on here. This guy's done some interesting things. He has about 30,000, 40,000 monthly listeners on Spotify. And he has about 12,000 listeners or followers on Instagram. But once again, it's not the fact that he just has these people. Like I know 30,000 or 40,000 listeners monthly on Spotify isn't the largest thing, but it's considerable. I know a lot of you aren't there. But even more importantly, it's how he made it happen. And I think it's one of the most doable ways for most of the artists when it comes to repeating. So we're going to get into that. Make sure you listen up. You're going to learn a lot of good stuff from this man. So again, Amir, what's up? How you doing? As you, as you said, you're an R&B artist. First of all, how long have you been doing this in the first place? Uh, yeah, what's up, everybody? Thank you, Sean, for, for having me on your channel. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, like, so I've been doing music. I actually started off as a producer and writer. I had no intention of being an artist initially. Hmm. And then kind of the way the industry changed and opportunities for producers and writers got less and less. And then I decided, you know what, I happen to sing, so why not just build something on my own? And that's kind of how it started. So I thought I should just own my own thing, my own brand and my own sound. Hmm. So that's pretty much where it started from. And it was pretty much part time until about a year, year and a half ago. Dope. So that's when I really started going hard. Got you. So, yeah. I mean, it's interesting you say that because I find that, especially in an industry like a music industry, but in a lot of ways, just across a lot of industries today, at some point, just building your personal brand is also becomes a leverage just to kind of maintain and keep you from losing your value. And <laughs> right, people will work around you. People don't need songwriters. People need a reason to work for you outside of your actual skill set these days. That brand 100%. is. Yeah, man, you nailed it. It's like, and I saw that like back in 20, up until 2014, I only wanted to be a songwriter, like a major label songwriter. And I had some opportunities. I've worked with some major label artists and here and there, like, uh, but I don't know, man, there's always like this sense of like dependence, you know, like you're always dependent on somebody to give you an opportunity. You could write a hundred songs. One of them might get cut and then it doesn't make their album. Or if it does make their album, if it doesn't become a single, then you got you're, you literally you're gonna make like a hundred bucks for all that effort you know like it's yeah. so it's not it's not it's not really worth it mm. so it's uh it just depends what you want and for me like that life just it just didn't appeal to me anymore so i figured and i love making music and i figure it's better if i'm gonna invest all this time making all these songs i should at least own those songs and release them and maybe get something out of it that way like maybe some people will like it maybe the labels might not but i might get fans out of it or so did you write four labels? Uh, well, I had like, I've uh, not necessarily, ha I've had songs put on hold by, by labels, like major labels. And then obviously that whole dance, I'm sure you know how that, that happens, you know, where they where you have songs sitting and they get circulated and then nothing happens. Then two years go by and then the sound changes. And then, so I just got tired of it, you know, like I'm like, forget this. I can't deal with this anymore. Yeah. It's the different side of that that label beast. We talk a lot about that for um, in terms of artists being shells, but yeah, when it comes to the songwriter thing, it's it's I mean, brutal, man. Because like and now artists are writing their own stuff pretty much for the most part, and they have their own teams. And if you're not in their team, you're not gonna you're not really gonna get in there unless you know somebody, right? So true. true. That's probably need to do an entire just interview. Usually, yeah, yeah. Because you, I think you talk more about artists, but. Um, I think you've done some videos on producers and songwriters too, from what I remember. Yeah, not as many on songwriters yet, but that's because I have a I plan to make a few things happen. I'm I'm more on that later, right? Um look forward to that in 2019, I guess. Yeah, yeah. exactly. 2019 to come. So check this out, man. You talked about the fact that you've been only doing this seriously about a year, year and a half, right? Yeah, before that it was like super part time. I would put up a video like every three months, you know. Right, so right, right. So what was the biggest shift? You said, all right, you were less 
um, consistent, it sounds like. But tell me some more in terms of, as a matter of fact, if you could paint the story of what your day to day looked like before any of you were working a part time job or. A yeah, like I had a job. I actually used to work in finance and accounting, believe it or not. But, you know, and then this sounds bad, but I absolutely hated it. <laughs> so, you know, so, so I'm like, I always wanted to do something in music because that's just where my interests lie. And because I'd been doing it part time and on the side for so long, I had built up a skill set as a producer and I'm like, you know what, like I can do it. I'm not exactly where I need to be skill wise, but at least I can do it now enough where I can put out pretty decent content. And with every song you get better and better. And as you release more, you keep improving and building on it. And at that point I just decided to just pull the trigger and just go full time with it. So that's kind of, how it happened, yeah. Hop in in the interview, man. <laughs> What's going on? Huh? How are you? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> hey, that's my Actually, day. I'm worried somebody might walk in too, man. So let's see. You know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, on, man. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, that's my dad, man. He's... No worries, man. Well, you can see me? Of course I can see you, man. <laughs> 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 yeah, but um, so check this out. Um. I'm gonna get back, get my train of thought back in line. All right, so, oh, so that was like early 2017 when I went full time with it. When I released my song "Choice" around that time. Okay. And yeah. actually, that song was part of it because, like, when I saw the reaction that that song got, I'm like, and I'd never gotten a reaction like that on anything I'd ever released before then. So that's kind of gave me like some hope, like, oh wow, like people really like this. So mm -hmm. maybe I should go okay. a little harder and invest more into it. You know, so. All right, so with that being said, like let's go into the mindset of being super consistent. You're one of the most consistent artists I've talked to on your level of, you know, you're working pretty much by yourself from my yeah. now. And every time I I everything I've, you know, learned about you and the conversations we've had, like I mean, it was more of a what do they call it? I mean, you know, just the consistent, the the the, the tortoise slow and steady wins the race. That's what that's your mentality, yeah. seems like right? It, it feels pretty slow to me because I'm like in the trenches when I'm doing it. But yeah. yeah, like you know what? Because I'd never been consistent before then, and obviously, if you're not, and my advice to any artist would be, whatever you're gonna do, just do it every day, even if it's like two hours, an hour, whatever you can do, just do it every day because it's very easy to lose momentum when you take two weeks off, three weeks off, and then getting the ball rolling again is, is not easy, right? But keeping it rolling is much easier. So that's kind of where my mentality came from. Like, just, I'm like, I have to, because I have free time now, I'm going to do this full time. So I have to be putting out content regularly. I have to be constantly improving my production skills, my mixing skills, writing skills, mastering, all that. Like, I do all that stuff myself, right? So. Well, how many songs do you drop a week or a month? So I did weekly songs, like what people like to call the Rust strategy, which is only the surface of the Rust strategy, by the way. Right. That's not all there was to it, obviously. But um, I did that for 35 weeks. And it wasn't all original songs. Some of them were covers and remixes. But it was a lot of work because I made all the beats. I had to do all the mixing and mastering and recording and vocal comping. It takes forever, right, to do all that and doing it. And every Monday at 7 p.m. for 35 weeks, I dropped a song. And after that, I switched to like every other week or every three weeks. Like after that, I'd built up enough of an audience where I felt like I wanted to focus more on quality rather than just churning out content. And I also kind of eventually want to move away from doing covers and remixes completely. So, mm -hmm. you know, so like uh, I just kind of I hate to say this. I did burn out a little bit, but I'm still consistent. Like I don't go I, like I'll never go six months without dropping a song like that'll just never happen now. Yeah. So. I mean, you trained yourself. You kind of, now you know yeah. how to you know, move. But like the, the good thing is like those 35 weeks, it, was, it wasn't just to grow a fan base or an audience. It was also to build discipline, you know, and also to build skill and to improve because I knew I had to get better at mixing and I knew, I knew my vocals had to get better. My production had to get better. It was good, but it wasn't as good as it could be. Right. You know, so those 35 weeks, they forced me to improve like crazy. I packed in like three years of work into, into seven months, right? So... I'm so glad to hear you say that, man, because people ask the question so much about the rust strategy, quote unquote, like you said, from the standpoint of 
just dropping a lot of music because they want attention. But I really try to get, especially early on artists to focus on the fact that you need to get better anyway. And that's- 100%, yeah. You have. Like, even if you aren't dropping the, the songs, you still should try to be saying, hey, I'm gonna have one song every single week or something like that. Some kind of- practice Because marketing only works if your product is good, right? It just, you could, you could have a million dollar marketing budget and not have, have, have a horrible song. It's probably not gonna do that well. Maybe it might, you might get lucky if it's so bad that it goes viral just because it's that bad, you know, but Another thing, yeah. But you don't want that, right? Like no artist wants to be, every artist wants to be taken seriously. So for that, you have to put in the time on, and unfortunately there's no shortcut to that. And because with me, I didn't want to just be an artist. I also wanted to be a producer and mix engineer and all this stuff. So I have to put in even more time because I have to acquire more skill, right? Yeah. So. Okay, so let's get into the details of this weekly drop that you had that was almost nine months so nine months yeah exactly you drop a song every week what platforms are you dropping your music on and then after that what are you doing to get attention on those platforms okay yeah so yeah like like you mentioned the rust strategy like i'm sure rust was doing a lot more than just dropping the songs because you have to drive traffic to your songs too otherwise nobody's going to hear them unless you're already famous right Unless you already have 100,000 followers, your songs are not going to organically spread. You know, so it's, uh, so what, what I was doing is it's a combination of things like uh, I tried influencer marketing, I've tried Facebook ads, I've done all of it. And to be honest, it wasn't just one thing. It was kind of, uh, it was a combination of all of them. And eventually, like as my stream started growing by putting in the weekly songs, I hit a turning point after like week 10, 11, where I got, then what happens is Spotify has algorithms that you can start triggering to, especially if people really like your song, you know? So then, then you might have some organic growth when you hit the algorithms. So you mentioned platforms. I didn't, I was releasing the songs on every single platform, including SoundCloud. Now I don't really release music to SoundCloud as much anymore. I'll do it maybe once every three months just to keep it kind of alive. But that's because SoundCloud, I feel like it's, honestly, man, I hate to say it, but it's like a black hole. You know, like it's, it's like you put music there and it's, you get nothing out of it, you know? So now they've offered monetization to some artists, but, uh, I don't know, man. I don't think it's a good platform to grow a fan base. That's just my opinion. For me, I don't think it's the best. Like, I think YouTube is a much better platform if you want to just organically try to grow a fan base. Well, that's just my opinion. You know, I could be that opinion though. Sorry. Why, why do you have that opinion? I would love that perspective. Uh, the reason that I, well, SoundCloud's algorithms have changed. So like back in the day, you could put up a song on SoundCloud and it was searchable, but now nothing is searchable on SoundCloud. You have to drive traffic to it. And if I'm gonna, if I have to drive the traffic to it, then I'd rather drive it to Spotify because Spotify is like a much healthier platform, right? Yep. SoundCloud is not. And also Spotify, you get a return on your investment. On SoundCloud, you don't. So just from a business standpoint, I don't think it's a smart idea to be driving traffic there. And also YouTube, YouTube has a better search algorithm than SoundCloud does. And the suggested algorithm, like the suggested videos, it's much better. So you have a much better chance of organic growth on YouTube, I find, than, than you do on SoundCloud. But again, man, that's just my opinion. I, that's just my experience. So I don't know, somebody else might have had a different experience. I think SoundCloud used to be good back in like 2014, 15, but now I think it's basically useless. Generally so. speaking, I can I can pretty much agree with you. I'm I'm not going to get into an argument or or anything about it because I pretty much agree with you. But I also just wanted to make sure people heard your additional perspective because I hear so many people speaking for SoundCloud and not that many people speaking against it. But yeah. to really hone in on your process, you drop it on you drop music on every single platform. So, yeah, so like the same song on Monday. On Monday, it would be on YouTube. It would be on SoundCloud, especially in the earlier weeks. And then I use DistroKid to get it to Spotify, Apple. And they're pretty fast. Like you can get a song there probably the next day or the next what two is, days. What about Sometimes I try to line it up so it matches up exactly on Mondays, but I couldn't always do that. Yeah. So <laughs> That's a different you know? thing. So when you talk about influencers and all these other things that you did, right? That was just trying to figure out what's going to work. Of course, some of the things worked. Oh, but it was all experimenting. Yeah. Everything was an experiment. Like this whole year was a giant experiment for me. Like I tried so much stuff. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Some of it was 
a huge waste of money and time. Some of it was a good use of money and time. So it's, uh, so yeah, man, like I, and I encourage all artists to do this, like, cause to make it really simple, it's just about making the song, finding your audience and driving traffic. If you want to make it super simple, that's really all it is. Yeah. Right? And, uh, how you drive that traffic, I don't think is, is as uh, relevant because it just depends on your, your genre, your niche and what you feel comfortable doing. Like I tried it all pretty much. I tried influencers, ads, doing covers and remixes, all of it, you know? So I'll try anything just to, just to see if it works or not. Right. I mean, I think it's important for people to definitely remember that you everybody's going to have a different way of driving their audience a lot. Of exactly. Time, right? Exactly. Particularly at the beginning, but you talked about something that's very important when it comes to you had all these things that you did at the beginning, but after a while you talked about Spotify kind of automatically triggering things. So yeah. when I found like, even with the YouTube page, right, no matter what, whatever kind of audience you're trying to build, there's always a threshold where at some point, like at, at the beginning, you're reaching out, trying to get in people's face. Hey, I need your attention. I need your attention. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. But at some point, you have enough of an audience where you can be a self-contained. You still want to bring in new right. faces, but you have, you know, you're going to like drop a post on Instagram and get at least as many of uh, likes, right? You know, exactly. which can then possibly trigger the Instagram algorithm and you know, eventually boost it to the explore page based on your own audience versus exactly. outside. And it sounds like you went through that process. I did. And with Spotify, it happened earlier because I was more, I don't know, like I was more active about driving people to Spotify initially. Mm -hmm. uh, I even get algorithm bumps on Apple music now. Really? You know, I, don't, I don't drive. And I, I never, ever drove traffic to Apple music ever. So any, and I think I just, I'm about to hit a million total streams there now. On Apple Music? Apple Music, yeah. You never drove traffic there. Never drove traffic there. It was always to uh, Spotify. Because I feel like Spotify is where there's, there's more users on Spotify. So I feel like it's probably better to invest in that for now. Even though Apple is caught up a lot. Like Apple's bigger in the US. But globally, yeah. Spotify is still much bigger. Right. I think so. that's investor... Um, it's a better investment in Spotify as a whole right now right. just because of the actual work that an artist has control over. Spotify is more malleable to their impact. Like you, it's exactly. very little that an artist can do with like no connections to certain people at Apple or in the industry or something like that, that they can do on Apple. Right? It's exactly. self-contained. It's, it's interesting. And also, like, I feel like Apple Music's algorithm is weird, you know? Like, I don't quite understand it. It seems yeah. almost random to me the way it works. Yeah. Like, one day I'll see, oh, my song got put on all these people's playlists, like, personalized playlists, and I'm, I just don't understand it because I don't personally use Apple Music. I use Spotify. Yeah. So I understand Spotify a lot better than I understand Apple Music. For sure. Okay. And so I also like it better, you know? I just think it's a better platform. But that's just my personal opinion. So. Cool. So... First of all, you start doing what you're doing. You're on all these platforms. At some point, you make a decision that you're on Spotify. Um, you're on Apple Music. You're not doing SoundCloud. That was something based on what you learned. Now, and, and, you know, and then you made a perfect personal decision, what works for you and what you prefer. Right. From an ad standpoint, because you started off doing everything, what, after all of your learnings, what now works for you as far as your system that you like? So now, like, uh, um, I'm kind of doing that. Like, now I am having some organic growth, too. Like, I think I mentioned, like, I, I used some, I tried influencer marketing. Like, now a lot of influencers are using my music without even me asking them to, you know? So, but I, it's happened a few times now, yeah. So, like, people with, like, hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram or even YouTube, are now starting to use, but see, I can't control that as far as things that I can control yeah. right now. I'm going to try to re-strategize. Like I've pushed a lot of singles. So my next step might be to push like a project and see, cause I haven't experimented with a project yet. So that's kind of my next, I would encourage as an artist, if you have like no fans, don't even bother making an album. It's just going to be a waste of time. Yeah. I would just do singles, release the single, learn what you can move on to the next one and repeat that process over and over again. That's just, again, that's my opinion because I feel like an album is a huge investment. Like you're going to have to spend what, six, seven months making it. 
And if you have no fans, you just did all that work. And now the real work begins because now you have to start marketing it. Yeah. Like making the music is the easy part, right? Like getting it heard is much harder, especially now because there's so much music being made. 20,000 songs get added to Spotify every single day. Like that's the competition. It's ridiculous. So yeah. tell me more about, because one of the things that baffled me, if, I, I wouldn't say baffled, but what I loved, um, because I didn't hear other artists talk about doing something like this. And once again, it just speaks to consistency was your $5 a day Facebook strategy. Uh, I did that in the early days. So like, I, I think when I, when I, when I spoke to you a year ago, I think that's when I was doing that. So I did that for about three months Yeah. and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to let it run. Like people like this song. I'm just going to just let it run and see what happens. And honestly, like I kind of forgot about it and I just yeah. let it run in the background. And then, after three months, like I did build up when I looked back, I'm like, wow, it actually built me up a little bit of an audience and a fan base. And people were checking as I was dropping those songs every Monday, my streams on Spotify were starting to slowly creep up. And then uh, I dropped a cover, uh, sorry, a mashup I did of uh, Tamiya's song, Into You. Yeah, I remember and, that one. And I mashed it with Russ's song, Wife You Up. I remember and that one like really exploded. You know, so like people like that one just hit all the algorithms. It went crazy. And uh, I think it's almost at half a million streams now on Spotify. Oh, that brings a question to my head. So that's essentially a remix cover. I've been asked before, and this isn't really something I get into um, as far as some of the legality type things. But, but I've been asked, when you put a cover on a platform like Spotify, what does that do? for you like can you do that have you gotten any kind of strikes or anything like that no i haven't because uh well with distro kid the good thing is and i would use distro kid for any artist watching um they acquire the cover license for you so you're covered and keep in mind like there's two licenses right you have master recording and you have song and you have the copyright which is the the writing of the song so i don't own the writing of the song but i own my master which is the the version of the song that i created so I'm allowed to use that and put it like I'm only getting master revenue. So Spotify also pays publishing royalties to the to the songwriters that wrote the song. Right. So they would be getting the back end royalties that way, which don't come to me because it's a cover. I didn't write the song, but I created that arrangement of it and I created that recording. So it's hell on both sides, like just a songwriter. Now everybody who's covering my song is is like, I'm yeah. Oh, dude, there's tons of covers on Spotify. Like, uh, yeah, like there's artists who only have covers on Spotify. It's just you just have to buy the license, right? You can do it through DistroKid, and there's a company called Louder. You can do it through them. So, TuneCore has their service, too, where you can use it. I don't use TuneCore. The reason for me is not because they're not a good company, but because I release so much music that it was cost prohibitive. Like I, like I would have been paying what, $5,000 a year just to tune core. It just didn't make any sense. Got you. So um, just to hone in on that process a little bit when it comes to distro kid and how they kind of obtain the rights for you. So you're saying once you submit a song, their algorithms pretty much picks up on the fact that it's a cover and they obtain it, or do you submit and let them know that it's a cover? So when you, uh, when you choose the option, they ask you, just okay, is this a cover? And then you click, yes, it's a cover. And then they ask you who the original songwriter is and sorry, who the original artist is. And then they go and obtain the license for you. So I like that better because it's less work for me. Now I don't have to use a third party to go get a license. Yeah. You can buy a license yourself. You can just go to louder.com and buy one. Right. And so you don't have but, to pay anything extra. They just handle the money. For no, you do have to pay. So you have to pay, I think it's a dollar a month to have the cover license. So it can add up if you're gonna keep it up there. It's not bad, it's 12 bucks a year, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Nice. For, the, for the service they're providing, like now you have peace of mind, right? You don't have to worry about uh, getting a license and worrying about all that. I'd rather just pay the 12 bucks and not worry. For sure, especially as an artist. I mean, primary, anything. Like, I'm already doing too much work, man. That's like one less thing for me to do, yeah. you know? You need peace of so, mind as an artist. So, yeah. Cool, all right. Um, so. After the Facebook strategy, which worked for you, um, you said you got, you saw a decent little bump, and then after that, you started to also see some organic. And it wasn't the beginning of your strategy, and it's not no. what you're doing now. You stopped doing it. Why? Um, so it's not that I'm gonna. I've stopped it completely, or I don't want to do it. Like I'm back into the experimentation phase because I've reached a certain level now. Like I have a certain amount of fans, and I have 
a few million streams here and there on Spotify and Apple, whatever, which was almost nothing a year ago, you know? So uh, now to get to the level higher than that, I'm going to have to do something differently, right? Like I can't be doing the same thing over and over and expect different results, right? So I have to, I'm kind of going to like maybe visually, I have to try different, if I'm going to run ads, I have to try a different visual maybe. Or, you know, like maybe I'll try to promote a show instead of just promoting music all the time. Because I have a pretty decent sized catalog now that I feel like I should be building another part of the business, which is like the touring business. Got you. And I want to get into that. But right before that, you mentioned visual, which reminds me, I haven't been in a long time, but I could have sworn you had a YouTube page and you had a decent little traction there did you not uh yeah like i I do have a youtube channel um i have about twenty eight thousand subscribers or so that's more than decent how did that that was pure organic i have never run like youtube ads i don't do at all because i just don't like youtube's targeting i don't know i just don't i've tried them i just don't like them okay so i'm not saying they don't work like they obviously do work otherwise they'd be out of business right but uh I don't know. For me, they haven't worked. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I need to learn more about them, but now, it was all organic just from posting covers and from posting remixes. And If it ever becomes relevant, maybe we can talk about that offline because your music is like, it's pretty clean, so to speak. It's not like something that they would ban your ads, which is the problem. Most artists have to yeah. do anyway. There are some beneficial things. Not saying it is, it is something that you should do, but maybe we could figure or out. Maybe maybe because my visuals, like I don't have a music video. It could be just that. Like my my copy or like my like the way my visuals look were probably the reason. Then because YouTube is very visual driven, right? So mm-hmm. it could have just been that. It might not become your your ongoing system, but at some point there's probably going to be something where it could be beneficial for you. But with that being said, you have twenty eight thousand people. This is all organic. Is it because you did some covers? Is that what what you think it is? Uh, mostly covers, yeah. And then I've had like I've had influencers on YouTube use my music too, so they drove traffic as well. So things like that happened as well. One of my covers, like I did a cover of an Akon song back in the day, and that video's starting to blow up now. You know, it's yeah. almost at half a million views now. So how long ago uh, did you do it? Three years ago. I don't know why. I don't know why I decided to take off now. Hey, it my mind. just sounds like all your shit just starts moving at some point. You have a lot of, yeah. you have your system, but it just sounds like you have a lot of stuff that just organically starts to move at some point or another. Why is that? Yeah. But I guess like, I think the reason why that happens is like, you have to be willing to take the action without knowing what the result is going to be initially. Because I could never have predicted that that Akon cover, like that song is like 11 years old and my cover is even three years old. Would have thought, you know, but and uh and a lot of things like i did a cover of like a savage garden song truly madly deeply mm-hmm. that one's blowing up on you spotify like i think a year ago it had like nothing like five six thousand streams and now it's at two hundred thousand. i didn't do any promotion for it it just took off on its own so just at some point you have the main things that you are promoting but because you're building this catalog and things are starting to tick and catch on at just random times because you have more people that are coming in the funnel yeah because like i have a mixture of original songs like i have a ton of original songs too it's not all covers and remixes but yeah i'd rather put like marketing effort towards original music because i see the covers and remixes as two things as content and as marketing because people are always going to be searching for those songs maybe the newer songs get more search volume but even like an old hit like that truly madly deeply like that people are still going to be looking for it that's true that's another thing because you did do things that are SEO driven. These are covers. People are always going to be looking for them. So you will have organic marketing. You don't have to um, always be marketing yourself. So that explains some of it. I want to just make that clear for people who, exactly. are, who I, don't, I don't want people to think, oh man, this guy is just making stuff up or like he's just a lucky person. That no, and then, dude, like it wasn't, I can say, man, like there are artists who get lucky, but we all know that 99% of artists are where they are because they worked extremely hard and they spent, and like, it doesn't happen for free. Like it it costs money to get to a certain level. If you want to be as famous as Usher, that's not going to happen for free. It's going to cost millions of dollars. You know? Definitely that. Well, I mean, and even when you think about some scenarios to bring even more logic to it, let's say that huge movie 
uh, for Queen came out recently. What is it? Uh, what was the name of it? Oh, Queen, I haven't seen well, that. Queen is a big rock band. I haven't seen it, but they were huge back in the day. Right, they were huge, yeah. Um, one of their, it's a movie named after one of their songs that came out. A uh, very popular song. Oh, Bohemian oh, Rhapsody. Is Bohemian a, Rhapsody, yeah. yeah. Freddie yeah. Mercury, yeah. Exactly. That came out probably last month. And when that movie came out, I guarantee you, there was an influx of listeners to the songs because exactly. nostalgia, all that stuff. Now people are looking. If you did a cover of that song, more people are also going to find the covers of those songs that they start to look for again. So there's all these real world things that could happen at any point that could trigger your organic movement once again, outside of just the fact that new people coming into your funnel can just all of a sudden start to find interest. Like my Fetty Wap video, which is my very first video, it looks good now. Oh, there's like a hundred something thousand views. Maybe it's nice. a two or seven looking, looked at oh, it. I've seen that one. Yeah, yeah. That was my very first video. That video was, I mean, I was like, yo, this thing is moving, man. It has way more views than everything else when it had like 200 views. Right. But then right. It, like that was just my most popular video, but it stayed, like it took maybe two months for it to get to a thousand, you know, wow. and then it maybe three months, it got to 3000. But then one day, like my subscribers start going up and up and I'm like, what the hell is happening? And I go back and look to that video. And then like, it got caught on some random YouTube playlist and it just started moving. So yeah, that can happen. So when, once your shit is out there, it can happen. Just keep it can going. happen if the content is good and like you're consistently uploading new content on YouTube. Like YouTube does reward people who are consistent. Like I remember like you were dropping videos like left and right, man. I remember you had that phase where, cause I, I'm subscribed to your channel. So oh, yeah. I know I, I was watching them and I actually found your channel through your Russ video on the when you did a, a video on how Russ blew up or whatever, I think oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like over a year ago. And that's how I found your channel because okay. I was curious about Russ's strategy. Cause he, he, I feel like I think like him because I'm all about self-reliance. Like I don't like to rely on other people at all and right. not because I don't like other people. It's just because I don't know, man, like after I had that bad experience, like doing all that songwriting and producing and waiting for labels and artists to give you the green light, I'm like, forget this. I have to do it myself. So that's what got me interested in Russ. And then I was searching about Russ interview, whatever, blah, blah, blah on YouTube. And that's how I found you, mm. you know? So that video will probably like keep getting you people. And, and I think that's how YouTube works. Like when new people get interested in a topic, they're going to start searching it. And as more people search it, you're going to start rising in the algorithms and true but that's organic. But my, I would like to say that you can't rely on that. You know, you have to keep moving. You can't wait. Exactly. That too. That's the biggest difference. Like, and that's the difference that like, I had in mindset. Like back when I used to do music part-time, I'm like, Oh, well, I dropped the video. It didn't blow up. Okay. Well, I'll just wait now. You know, like you, <laughs> you, you can't do that, you know? So you have to just keep moving. Like once I release a song, I forget about it. I even forget the lyrics. Like it's completely out of my mind. And I just move on to the next one. You'll, fact, you'll like, remember the lyrics if you have to tour, if it yeah. blows up and all that stuff. And another thing I did a lot is like, I, I used to do a lot of live streams on Facebook for my Facebook page. And yeah. my fans can attest to this. Like I forget lyrics all the time when I'm even singing my own song. So I got to start rehearsing a bit more, you know? So yeah. that's the downside of releasing too much music. <laughs> so that's that's hilarious so i'm sure you'll figure out a popular set especially as you move into a certain level of your career when you release projects of course you'll probably be moving at a different pace where you have it all in your mind but yeah i mean it's definitely true you have to keep moving like you can't i don't care if you're on a label or not like everywhere you are in the industry you pretty much no, no matter what happens you have to keep moving as if you have to and I've, and I've seen this happen to a lot of artists where like they get YouTube famous, like they might hit like a, a big amount of subscribers and then they get signed and then they think, oh, I'm signed now. I can just chill and just let the label do everything. And then what happens is the label tries, it doesn't work out. And now because they haven't been active on YouTube, they've lost all their fans. They've lost their deal with the label because they haven't been profitable for the label. It's just They're not, you can't, you can't think like that. You have to just be in it for the long run. For sure, no. the label is going to stop giving you attention if you, if you're if you stop moving anyway. And then, but I mean, just another back to that Fetty Wap video again. That's my first video. I was probably like twenty videos, thirty videos deep before it started to take off. You know, so right. definitely couldn't have waited for that. And if I didn't do those other videos, I doubt that video would have even taken off. No, it probably wouldn't have. YouTube so, rewards consistency. 
they they do it just that's just the way these algorithms set it up keep that in mind so to nip that in the bud you i want to hear your mindset on this next phase of your career because you've you've done what you've done you've built true systems where you will be consistent hey i'm going to re release a song a week i'm going to do this five dollar a day thing on facebook um like just multiple things you talk about like it's in a systematic way it's not hey i'm going to make this huge effort and go hard for a month and then just sit back for three months and things like that yeah. that's what i really love because and i hate to admit this but i used to think like that three four years ago and now i don't because i know it doesn't work it just doesn't work it really is it's, it's just it's a really unhealthy way to think because it's like the lottery mindset like i just want to win the lottery and then it's chill right but then you really don't play the lottery yeah i don't either yeah mindset. i don't gamble like i don't do stuff with that mindset because i don't want to it's just a that's the exact same reason why i never got into bitcoin or any of that stuff because it was lottery mindset you know like i'm just yeah. not gonna participate oh, in that, that emotional but, yeah yeah so the thing is like so for the next phase i'm not gonna lie like it's very every plateau as you get to a higher level is harder to break because now you're competing at a higher level right yeah. So when you have no fans and you have no streams, it's hard because you have no social proof. So you have to work very hard to get a small fan base. And then, but once you're like, once you're kind of, once you have a, like you said, a system after that, to get to a higher level where you can tour, where you can pack 500 people in a room and do a show, that's going to require a much, a, a bigger investment. It's going to require higher quality content. It's going to require smarter marketing not necessarily more marketing, but smarter. Like how can you scale? Yep. You know, so these are things I'm still trying to figure out. I haven't figured them out yet, but I know I have to change something in my approach to get to that higher level. And, uh, in the meantime, I'm not going to stop creating content. I'm still going to drop a song every two weeks because you have to keep your skills sharp and you have to like the fan base that I do have, I want to keep them engaged. Right. And I, yeah, I can't just disappear and expect them to like, be happy with me for doing that you know so so uh well the biggest thing that happened i guess for this year is like i learned a lot not only about like uh getting better at producing and singing and all that but just like well who my who my audience is you know like i know who likes my music and i know who doesn't so now i know for any future marketing efforts i know exactly who not to show it to and who to show it to you know so I, I really have a very good understanding of who my audience is now. Dope. So I'm going to use that knowledge, whatever I try next, like maybe different influencers, different visuals for YouTube ads, maybe whatever, you know, I don't think that the, the strategy, the, the actual action you take matters as much as like the, the overall vision. So as long as you're constantly trying and, and improving everything you're doing, like it should keep building. Mm. So I'm going to push back on that. I need a little bit more clarity. Except yeah, well. I hope I'm explaining this. Uh, I The reason is like, I haven't fully decided what my next step 100% is going to be, but I have an idea. Like, I know I need better visuals. I need more songs like the ones that did well and less songs that were experimental. Like, I know what my fans like and I know what my sound is now, which I didn't 100% know a year ago. So mm -hmm. I want to apply all this knowledge now to the next phase and maybe try the same marketing with better content better visuals better understanding of the audience and right. see what happens then you know okay so overall i'm i guess i'm interpreting it as as long as you're committed to the overarching vision the strategy right before you that you're using doesn't matter less it's more about being committed to the action of figuring out if that strategy works or not and, and starting another one if if that one didn't, didn't work right exactly so like let's go to a specific thing let's let's talk about ads for example Instagram ads. I see 30 Instagram ads every single day from different artists. I don't know about you, but I see them all the time. Oh yeah. And I hate well, to say I this, but 99% of them are very bad. Like I would never want to click on them. Not because the music sucks. I'm not saying the music sucks. I'm saying the ad sucks, you know? So these are things you need to test and try yeah. But I give those artists credit because at least they're trying, they're yeah. testing. Right. And same thing with influencer marketing. Influencer marketing can work great. Uh, or it can work very badly depending on who the influencer is. Like, for example, I had one of my songs used in a makeup video and that video has like 1.6 million views. And because my audience is 90% women, that was a perfect fit, you know, because I don't know any, I don't know a lot of guys who watch videos like that. Yeah. And because I'm an R and B singer and most of my fans are women, uh, that video would be a perfect fit. But then if like, uh, 
I've had girls who are like uh, fitness YouTubers and fitness Instagram models use my music in their videos and those ones didn't do well because that maybe their audience is mostly male, you know? Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> they might be following them maybe because they just think that she's attractive or whatever and they want to follow her for that reason and they're not going to give a shit about my music, you know? So the full context is everything. The context is everything. So, and the same thing goes with ads. Like if your ad is shown to the wrong person, it doesn't matter how good your ad is. Yep. Like when I see an ad on Instagram, like, I'm probably not that interested because a, I'm an artist. I'm so busy with my own stuff. I'm probably not that interested in seeing an ad from another artist, you know, but I might be interested. Like I like, uh, if I'm into martial arts or cars or whatever, and if I see an ad for that, I might be much more interested in that. Yeah. You know? So it just depends. Like it's like you said, the context is everything ads can work or they might not work. The, the downside of ads is that it costs money, right? So if you get it wrong, you're going to lose money. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I want people to really hold on to that context thing because that's probably a lot of where my personal genes lies. Like I, I over index sometimes even on just context. I think, 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 think about the context of everything. That's why I told people to stop tw uh, getting their music on dance videos and twerk videos because people doesn't work, man. Yeah, people are there like there, there's things that can pop off 100%. But if a dancer is posting every day and they're posting the new songs every day you might you're, you you could get some incremental gain don't get me wrong especially if the song is good but you're not going to get the impact you think in um in reflection to what their follower count is because people are there to see that dancer be great at dancing they're not there to listen to the music right exactly all those it things can happen. Happen. yeah it can happen like you said for example you know tank song when we yes. like that song became really popular choreography wise on youtube yeah. That, you which know, is a but, weird song to become popular choreography wise it's not yeah you know so like it can happen but then what i'm thinking is that's not the dancers making the song popular the song was popular with them you know exactly so it so it's like you said it's context like if a dancer people are probably following that dance channel just to see the dances they're probably not that interested in the music right because their music is so varied it's so different yeah and they're going to be dancing to different types of songs every single day right so if it was just like an R&B dance channel or a hip hop dance channel, then maybe, you know, then it might work. But yep. it's all about targeting an audience. Like you have to know, I think the biggest way to save time for new artists is like, don't promote your music to everybody because 99, this is going to sound really harsh, but 99% of people are not going to like your music. 99%. I know that sounds bad and it's harsh, but even if you, if I look at my, like my favorite singer is Craig David. I don't even like 90% of his songs and I'm like a huge fan of his, you know, <laughs> you know, but because I don't care, like I only like his big songs and I like some of the songs on his albums, but I don't like every song he's done. I'm a huge fan of his talent. I'm a huge fan of his, what he's achieved. Yeah. But, and it's the same thing with, uh, it's the same thing with music. Like if artists just know who to show their music to, they'll save a lot of time rather than uh, trying to win everybody over. Like you just can't, not everyone's going to like it. With that being said, kind of off base, um, it's not specific to you, but I also, it just reminds me that I remind people, especially if you think you're a diverse artist, but even when your songs don't seem super diverse, there's still some nuances. You can market different songs to different people. You don't have to, like there might be some overlap, but you don't have to just right. put all your music on one group of people, especially oh. if you don't think that same group would like the next song. Exactly, like you can have different groups, like. A lot of my fans even like country music and my stuff doesn't sound country at all, you know, but that kind of tells me that maybe I can try marketing something to a country audience and see what happens. It could be a good experiment, if anything. Exactly. Now, I don't yeah. encourage it personally. I like to, for artists to keep a certain sound and energy just to keep building and penetrate with a certain audience before you start to push too much diversity. But you always have to be cognizant of what people like and where you're putting it. Otherwise you're just interrupting at least. Be and as an independent artist, you also have to be mindful. Like if you want to be like somebody who's on like top 40, top 40 radio, like they have huge budgets, you know, like million dollars, half a million dollars. Like that's what it takes to win over a huge amount of the population. Right. Yeah. And how is an independent artist supposed to do that? It's almost impossible unless you have a huge investor backing you. You can't do it. Yeah, <laughs> that, you know, so. that's very real. So just to 
start to close things out because I don't want to hold you for too long. I really um, would love to know your mindset in terms of, all right, touring, a manager, like those more business or more logistical types of things. Are you at a standpoint where you say, I need some more people on my team and I'm trying to like, just what is that whole process? What's your thought process? Cause I know you don't have those things yet. I don't have those things yet. So it's funny you mentioned that. Like I've been realizing these things now after doing all this work, like I think I've spent probably 4,000 hours in the studio over the last year and three months, something like that, you know, like just churning out these songs. So I've realized that to scale, I can't possibly do everything on my own forever. I just can't. It's, there's just not enough time in the day, right? Unless I completely take a back seat from like making content and then just focus on touring, marketing, whatever, then I can do it. But I agree. Like, I think to get to the next level, like I'm probably going to have to learn about the touring side of the business because I don't know much about it. I've only done a few shows here and there and they're mostly, they've mostly been private events and things like that. But um, yeah, man, like I think eventually to get to the next level, like I would have to add people, maybe a manager, maybe a lawyer, an, a, an entertainment attorney, somebody, yeah. somebody who can guide you and like a tour manager or something like that, because otherwise it's just, there's just not enough hours in the day. I do have a co-writer I work with who, uh, who I write the songs with. And uh, I also have like, I used to have a mix engineer, but now I do the mixing myself, but eventually if to scale, like I think you have to have people on your team to get to like, the higher level like even russ like russ did all the making the music himself but he had a manager and he had like a graphic design person yeah. i have like a graphic person too who i use for certain things but so things like that man yeah i i 100 agree like definitely because that's like uncharted territory for me i haven't done touring yet you know so i'm basically starting from ground zero for that nice well, I'm definitely looking forward to another update sometime when you really get into that progress for touring. Because yeah, man, we should. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was, uh, it's just been crazy, man. Like how it's just such a process. Like uh, had I known it was going to be like this, uh, I don't think a lot of people when they start, they realize just how much work it takes. You know, like people only see, oh, look at Adele. She's like a multi-platinum artist, but they don't know how much work she did, you know? behind the scenes to get to that level i still see all the time that people believe all you have to do is make a ignorant song or or something like that or have do something crazy to get a lot of attention to have a career nah it's, it's a lot more complicated it might give you a short-lived you know spark of attention but actually like capitalizing being sustainable actually having a legit fans all that stuff is real work and you yeah. can't do the work and like, I look at Russ, like, that's why I have so much respect. I know he gets a lot of hate and I think it's unnecessary hate from, that's just my opinion, but. Yeah, people are going to hate you because you've mentioned him so much this interview. Yeah, because I, I respect him so much, man, because like he produces, mixes, masters, like, and I do that stuff too. And I know how much work it is, you know, like, and like R&B is even, I would say it's a little bit higher on the com complexity chart mixing wise like mixing and production wise it can be like like just because of vocals you have to like do a lot of harmonies and things like that so with him like and he does both he sings and he raps you know like he does everything it's yeah. it's like the work like and he's and he dropped 300 songs and he still only had like a thousand followers and then he started doing his weekly songs yep you know like i have i have how can you not respect that hey i mean i definitely do i i'll always try to make people clear that i started watching him before he was even on SoundCloud. Like my, just having that experience and to see how it came about, like to see the progress of going on YouTube. Like, you know, I, I met him for kind of a split second, told me about some of the stuff. I went on YouTube and said, who the hell is this guy? He had like 11 videos, not the highest production, but like 11 videos I didn't expect that versus literally every other artist I met that night had one song or, one video or nothing so, so he already uh, when you met him he already had his 10 albums done like or probably see but at that time i like the the story of 11 it was 11 albums was not a thing at that time 
All right. I know was content, right? I didn't, and I, I looked at everything individually because you know I didn't I didn't come in as oh this is an album or anything like that. So I I'm not completely sure. I think that probably was it, but I just knew it was a hell of a lot of content, and I and I was watching all videos. I'm sure he had his regular song somewhere, but. Right. I got tired of watching the videos just from sheer length, but I enjoyed all of them. Like in that time, it even felt like the videos were higher quality videos than they are in like in hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> like it was like, these are some good shit. Like, he never different. talks about like what he did marketing wise, but because yeah. no artist likes to talk about that, you know, like. Yeah, it's like, no. you know, showing, it's, it's like showing the magic trick, you know what I mean? Nobody wants to talk about that. Yeah. So it's, uh, I don't blame him because obviously he did 11 song albums and then, nothing popped off he probably figured out oh shit i better start marketing too and i'll drop a song a week right. and i think that's when something clicked for him because if you had just dropped songs and driven no traffic to them nothing's gonna happen right so yeah and i and i've seen enough where like it's pretty clear that his grind is legitimate right and right. think about yourself right as an artist your grind is legitimate and the things that you've done, whether it's the Facebook ad thing, whether it's trying influence or so many of the things, once things do start to click, the click for you isn't necessarily, oh, there's this one big thing I'm about to do. It's really a culmination of so many things. Yeah. It's hard. Like, you don't even necessarily feel like there's this one big trick. You know what I mean? So I, I, I don't even believe in a big break anymore. I don't think it exists. <laughs> Honestly, I don't. Because there's so many little things that go into it that... Yeah. Like Russ mentions it, it was his song "What They Want" that popped off for him. But yeah. you know, like after doing 350 songs, something is gonna have to, something's gonna have to give, right? So yeah. now some people would call that his big break, but I don't think that was his big break. I think it was just thousands of little things that added up a lot. Yeah, at that so. point is is just a result, the, uh, the result of your work, right? You know, exactly. You know, it's not a break. Like Talib Kweli always says that uh, people say he put Kanye on because he took Kanye he was the first person to take him on a tour but Tyler Kweli always says Kanye put Kanye on he's like time he's like I got a lot of cousins that rap a lot of people that rap but I thought Kanye was dope and I thought he would help my tour be even doper right. you know what I mean you <laughs> know now some artists do like trash people ahead of them so they can look good but he obviously isn't one of them but that's yeah. how I think about it like if your shit's dope like and you're doing the work like you do deserve, like you know, whether it happens or not, that's a whole another story. And getting into smaller stuff, but when stuff happens, it's yeah, the result of the work. Well, something will happen if you're constantly getting better and you're consistent. Like you might not become Ariana Grande, but whatever, you know, like <laughs> whatever, something should happen. You know, yeah. you might not become like uh, you might not be as big as Justin Timberlake, but yeah. something would happen. Something should happen if you're putting out good stuff and you're doing it consistently. Yeah, you know. Yeah. 100%. Hey, man, I think you you probably hit the record. You're probably my longest interview. Oh, yeah. Well, it's good, man. Like, I remember, like, we're kind of catching up, too, right, from a year ago. We should. I know, man. That, I, I know, man. I, I really wish. I'm, I'm, this time around, I got to make sure I, I check in with you more often, man, for sure. Yeah, man, definitely. We'll keep in touch on Instagram. And, yeah, man, I, I still watch your videos, man. Like, you have such good, uh, like, information. And bites i like that your videos aren't like 20 minutes long because as a viewer i like i hate that man like just having to sit through 20 minutes and the first 10 minutes is bs like i love that about your videos you get right into it you get to the you you explain and it's it's really helpful dope hey i appreciate that man you tell that to the people who would used to be in my comments saying hey man every single video should be an hour long nothing less <laughs> well, well some of them like this interview is going to be long right so yeah i think i think those little nuggets are much easier to absorb for the viewer so is there any last thing you would like to leave everybody with yeah guys thank you for watching i hope i helped in some small way and if you guys want to any r&b fans out there you guys can check me out on spotify youtube it's just my name uh all my socials are amir r&b a-a-m-i-r r-n-b so that's going to be up on the screen as well thank you again amir it's been thanks so much man it was a pleasure for sure. As always, everybody, if you got some comments, go ahead and put those things in the comment section. We'd love to know your thoughts on this interview. Definitely, if Amir, can, um, you can answer um, in the comments and get to people. Do yeah, guys, if you have any questions about like uh, any stuff I did, feel free to DM me or reach I out to me. Uh, love it. Happy to answer any questions. And 
Happy holidays. Thank you, everyone, so much. Yeah. Sure. Happy holidays to you, man. I, I really appreciate yeah. you sending your hand out to the subscribers. Hey, everybody, if you like this video, go ahead hit the like button. If you like it, might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.